Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to another IFMSA webinar. Uh, this one is a, particularly about uh, HIV-related discrimination in healthcare, and we are aiming at providing uh, a closer insight on, on the different aspects uh, that are related to discriminatory attitudes and, and stigma in healthcare. And for that, we have two uh, great experts and, and advocates uh, here joining us. Um, uh, we have Alice and Musa, and, and now I will kind of ask uh, both of them to introduce themselves as well, with like the work that they have done throughout the past uh, years and decades. Um, and and after that, we will move on to 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 some questions that are directed at kind of like like getting all the all the juice uh, out of their expertise and 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 kind of like also getting a bit of uh, extra knowledge and information for us to really take uh, in and use in our advocacy efforts and that like those questions will be led and moderated by our uh, IFMSA HAB and other STIs program coordinator Modupe um, from Nigeria and, and yes, like Alice, uh, Musa, if you could briefly introduce yourself, like with a few seconds and, and a few sentences, um, we can start maybe uh, with Alice. Thank you so much, Carla. So greetings, everybody. And thank you so much for um, asking me to take part. My name is Alice Wellborn, and I come from the UK. And I'm founding director of a, an organization called the Salamander Trust, which is a charity. And uh, I was diagnosed with HIV in 1992. So ever since then, I've been working on HIV and gender and human rights and all of the related issues over the years, um, including training uh, local medical students. So I'm really delighted to be on this call. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, uh, we will have like later on like a lot of time to uh, to to kind of like gain a lot from your um, uh, experience and, and knowledge. Um, we will move on with Musa. Um, Musa, can you briefly introduce yourself a bit? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, seems like we may be having a connection problem uh, with Musa. Uh, I will... Uh... Hello. Oh, hi. Hello. Oh, you had muted me. I had to unmute, sorry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yes. uh, this is Musa Lumumba from Uganda. Um, living with HIV since 2004, when I was diagnosed at the age of 15. Uh, I co-chair the... Uganda Youth Coalition, Adolescent Research and HIV a Coalition of around 15 youth led organizations working closely with the Ministry of Health to sharpen adolescent components within HIV and research um, strategies. And um, as well, a founding member of Y Plus, the Global Network of Young with HIV, and founding member of the PACT, of which FMC is part of and currently. I'm um, the African Youth Delegate to the board that governs UNAIDS, the United Nations Gen Program on HIV and AIDS. And I'm also now back at medical school, so um, I'm at, I should say I'm an established youth leader in the HIV response. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Um, now, like, like I mentioned, we will move uh on to the to the like the business part of the of the webinar um and we will have madupe take the lead on this um and she will start like by asking like a few questions to the uh, to our invited guests um madupe the floor is yours to take okay thank you thank you alice and musa so my first question is to alice hi alice i hope you're doing great so you are a strong advocate to women living with HIV and your expertise is more than valuable for future healthcare 
Could you make insights on what is lacking currently to address their specific needs? And then whether delivery HIV or not receives the highest attainable quality of care, which is free of stigma and discrimination. Also, what are the specific actions that your organization has managed to carry out on this matter in terms of discrimination and with to women with HIV or not? Hi, uh, Modupe and everyone. Thank you so much for those questions. So I'm going to weave the answers together a little bit. So um, first of all, what really what women living with HIV need is the, and 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 should have is the right to voluntary, confidential, and informed choices regarding if and when to start, stay on, adhere to um, HIV medication or not, whether even to have sex or not, how to have it, when to have it, whether to have it safely or not. Women have this right, and yet so often these rights are violated. So women living with HIV experience high levels of violence against women, even in healthcare settings, on diagnosis. And this hasn't to date been adequately recognized or addressed. Of course, there are many people who are health workers who treat women with HIV, others with H anyone with HIV with real respect. But unfortunately, there's still a huge number who are experiencing stigma, just um, adverse looks or, or comments or or strong discrimination, such as a lack of confidentiality or direct rudeness or failure to care um, through to coerced or forced abortion or sterilizations. And, and these have been widely reported. So uh, we call this structural violence when it's in healthcare settings. And there's a lot that's been written about this structural or institutional violence. So one thing which I think it's really important for um, healthcare providers to know about, and this is something that I ask the local students in, in one of the, the leading medical schools in the UK is um, I ask them, what's the UN Declaration of Human Rights? And these are second year students. And unfortunately, I'm often met with complete blank faces. So I think it's really important that medical students should know about the UN Declaration of Human Rights, including Article 26, which is all about the right to education, and Article 27, which is about the right to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. And then also, of course, going back to the Hippocratic Oath, we have the principles of do no harm and confidentiality, both embedded strongly in that. So HIV is often just one of multiple issues that women are addressing, including violence against women, which I've already just mentioned. And I think the WHO definition of health is, is a great example here of it's a very holistic description, and it's not just the absence of disease. It really talks about the importance of complete and, and um, full well-being of, of people. And I think that's really something important for us to hang on to, because it's often, unfortunately, again, lacking in, in health care for women living with HIV. So there's a real need for multidisciplinary teams and joined up thinking, particularly in relation to HIV and sexual and reproductive health and rights. And um, in that context, uh, we were asked by WHO a few years back to conduct a global values and preferences survey of women living with HIV in terms of our sexual and reproductive health and rights. And that fed into the new consolidated guideline on that topic, which was published earlier this year by WHO. And um, from the report which we published from that survey, which is available on our website, we created what we call our house model, which has very many different components of, of the house. And the foundation layers of the house were safety, respect, support, on which everything else um, was, was built. And then we had uh, strong walls of human rights and, and gender and meaningful involvement of women living with HIV in our healthcare. And then we also had different roof components, including um, fertility rights and um, uh, mental health issues and access to um, antiretroviral therapy and so on. So we were saying that all of these different components are a part of our lives and all need to be taken on board in our healthcare. However, of course, there's the critical importance of attitudes of physicians and frontline healthcare workers to people in their care. So I was talking to my husband about this webinar and uh, he used to be a retired, he's retired now, but he used to be a family doctor and also used to work in international health. 
And he had his appendix um, abscess operation, his appendix burst, and he had this abscess in his own hospital while he was a medical student, which was a really weird experience for him. And he realized then that far from assuming that the surgeon and the top doctors were the most important people who, who he was learning from, he actually realized that the most important people on the ward as he was feeling sick and poorly uh, were actually the nurses and the other ward staff, not the surgeon. Of course, it was obviously important that the surgeon did the operation well, but then you know all of that surrounding care and respect and support he realized was what was actually really important and made the difference in the experience of, of, the, of the people on the ward and whether they got better or not and how quickly. And there's been recent research from France that shows that the first contact with the HIV physician shapes the rest of an individual's likely ability to cope with their HIV diagnosis and adherence. So I think we really need to think about that, that the important attitudes. And then we treasure what we measure. So there's a critical need to measure quality of life. It's not just the number of people starting treatment or the number of people who've gone through the clinic process of the testing or whatever, but it's how the person in your care feels about how they have been treated, whether they trust you, whether they feel you're really addressing what they want rather than what you think they need. And unfortunately, in research we've done, and I'll come on to that in a minute, current national and global indicators around HIV are very top-down, very biomedical, very driven by a narrow, simplistic public health agenda, which doesn't recognize that critical importance of people needing to feel involved, understood, and supported. So when we're thinking about specific actions that Salamander Trust has, has managed to carry out with our partners, so our strap line is that we work on the rights track. And when we talk about the track, we talk about rights-based, person-centered approach in all we do. And track stands for training, the T, R is research, A is advocacy, and then the C and K are based on community knowledge. So there you have the track. So we've developed community level training programs to support people living with HIV or affected by HIV to overcome violence against women and violence against children. They're called stepping stones and you can read about them on our website. And then another training program that we do, which specifically links, links into healthcare settings is our 4M peer mentor work, um, which trains women living with HIV as peer mentor mothers to support other women through the pregnancy journey. And it supports them so that they can become a meaningful and critical part of a multidisciplinary team of HIV clinicians, obstetricians, midwives, social workers, and the peer mentor mothers who are offering 360 degree support to the women in their care. And then our research, uh, one research piece that we've been doing, the work with WHO and partners, which I mentioned, to develop these new consolidated guidelines which we're now hoping to start to roll out in different countries, and maybe you could all play a part in that, and that would be awesome. Then there's our research with UN Women and Partners that has been a global treatment access review to identify treatment access facilitators and barriers for women living with HIV. And it's clear that violence against women living with HIV is a huge barrier to treatment access at intimate partner violence level, in families and communities, and most worryingly at health center level. So this underlines the findings that we had from the WHO research. And then our research with UN AIDS and partners has been to develop ways of strengthening and expanding the evidence base around community-based programs to address violence against women in the context of HIV. And this is what I was describing. This has really revealed clearly the lack of indicators that women want relating to trust, relating to care, relating to support and quality of life and the huge need for health systems to place person-centered, rights-based care at the heart of all they do if they have any hope of being effective. And then just another piece of work that we've been doing is around language. So we've done a lot of work on the power of language and how negative language can perpetuate blame and how positive language can really shape the way we think and act in positive ways. So for example, we don't talk about people being infected because in a lay dictionary that means dirty or corrupt or tainted. We can instead say that people have acquired HIV. 
So we don't talk about PMTCT, we talk about perinatal care, which is a much more encompassing, a holistic approach to the pregnancy journey and preconception and post-delivery. And then we don't talk about failure to adhere, which is a very pejorative blaming approach. Instead, we say failure to retain in care, thinking, well, it's the health system that has the power. And, you know, maybe it's our fault, health system's fault for failing to support the women to stay in care. So those are just some of the things we do. And I think my 10 minutes has run out. Okay, thank you so much, Alice. That was wonderful. Thank you for your answers. And of course, you've provided a relevant perspective on an area that lacks visibility, even in medical, in the medical community. So thank you so much for that. So we'll be moving on now to a question from directed at Musa. So hi, Musa, now it's your turn. Musa, as a medical student and as a person living with HIV in a distinctive position, to change preconceived ideas and notions in age people to share with us what challenges do young people living with HIV maybe have you personally had Musa, is there anything in particular you do as a medical student to tackle prejudice and non-inclusive care from within the health system itself, um, if you'd wish to share with us? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Modupe. Uh, so when it comes to stigma and discrimination, Perhaps the, uh, first of all, I have to thank my colleague, my senior colleague, Alice, and uh, I think it's going to be so hard for me to fit in the picture after you have shared such um, rich information, Alice. Uh, much respect and love back here from Uganda. Um, um, perhaps my opening statement here is that stigma and discrimination against people living with HIV, whether they are women, whether they are young people, including adolescents, whether they are men, or their partners, I mean, just impedes people from accessing um, services that meet their needs, be it treatment, be it prevention or care. And now in the picture of what we are trying to achieve globally, the um, the end of AIDS, um, riding on the 1990-90 treatment targets, it then means that each one of us should look really at what is um, what is going to to impede us from achieving our targets, and including for young people and adults living with HIV. Um, the key some 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 of the um, challenges that young people and adolescents living with HIV have faced is from one from the organization of service of HIV service delivery in um, in in um, be it hospitals or clinics. You find that HIV treatment is provided in centers which are written on ART clinic. So ART, anyone who has gone to school will understand that, oh, those are, oh, are ARVs. So that's the, one of the biggest challenges when you're entering into a facility like this, when you have been already diagnosed. You get it? So, but also the other thing now, after you have got into the system, you've been enrolled, then you go into uh, being, you know, questioned a lot of stuff with very huge or wide um, treatment cards, you know, you, you, as if you're feeling, uh, you're feeling like a whole textbook. A number of questions here and there. So some other person who is looking at you will just be like, no, there should be something wrong with this person. Then after you have filled, filled uh, after your card has been uh, filled in, then you go to treatment itself. Um, the messages that we get from our colleagues and of course ourselves that we have experienced is, Young people and adolescents are always treated like treatment models. 
you know, treated as people who only need treatment in terms of either septrin and ART in terms of ARVs. You know, little is paid to the fact that these are human beings, these are sexual beings, these are people with desires beyond their, you know, their, their HIV diagnosis, which is HIV positive. Yeah, so you find that when you go into a clinic, someone will just give you ARVs and septri. No one wants to know whether you have that urethral discharge, that abnormal vagin discharge. If you are um, from a key population, for example, MSM, no, wants to, no one wants to inquire if you have that um, ano, ano ulcer or hemorrhoid, whatever it can be. You know? So we are treated like treatment models, and that's one of the, the key challenges. Then for our colleagues, the, the young women who are living with HIV who have, for example, gotten pregnant, then after giving birth, they are coerced into forced sterilization. You know, they undergo, for, uh, they undergo bilateral tube ligation in, the doctors think, you know, when, I mean, when you're living with HIV, you should not as well be in position to give birth to a baby who might also be HIV positive. So they think they're doing a favor to the young people by sterilizing them, not knowing that they, that they are um, undermining their, their right, just like uh, Alice said, their right to inform the choices. You know, people should be talked to. People should understand why ABCD has to be done. You know, and right now we know that with treatment, effective treatment, viral suppression, then your chances of passing over the virus to your um, unborn baby is uh, chances are reduced. So that's one of the one of the other challenges. Then the other thing is we have got many of our peers who have reported being denied services, for example, contraception, just like uh, Alice said. You know, so I don't know whether it is because of the um, because of the of the uh, the relationship between uh, some ARVs like nevirapine and efavirenz with some hormonal contraceptives, but you find that young people have always been coerced to go only for condom use. You know, so narrowing them down to condom use um, undermines their choice to other contraceptive methods that young people might be. You know, many of them report. They want to enjoy sex, and to them, some of them, enjoyable sex is live sex. So being in position to negotiate will make them understand why unprotected sex might not be safe for them needs to be bridged. So then the other thing is, um, there's this approach of positive prevention where at the end of the day, people living with HIV, including young people and adolescents, are told you have to prevent HIV. So this, this treats them as vectors of transmission. You know, that you who is positive, you should prevent others from acquiring HIV, which undermines, I mean, which puts them in, um, in a corner as if they're vectors. You who are positive should not have sex with those who are negative. You are positive, make sure that you're not passing. So, so that kind of arrangement has, has, served only to stigmatize and discriminate against uh, young people and adolescents in the communities th that they live in. And then the thing is that um, uh, when you get sick and you're admitted on the ward, you find that your, your, your admission, your, your admission uh, papers will always be written on ISS, or HIV positive, or something with plus. So this, at the end of the day, if it lands into um, hands of some other person who might be your friend who never knew about your status, then at the end of the day, everyone will know that, oh, those with the plus plus are HIV positive. So this has impaired, has, has impeded um, young people's access to services. They end up like getting, um, get, getting diagnosed let where for example they are in stage four of hiv which has its own challenges in terms of treatment and management the other thing is um hiv itself is associated with stigma and discrimination and that drives you to the margins of society then when you're from a key population group for example you're a sex worker because we have very many young people who are selling sex right now we have young, we have 
I mean, young people are not a homogeneous group. We are heterogeneous in that there are young people who are like, who, who, who are like straight. We have young people who are MSM, who have young people who are, who are lesbians, transgender, and so on. So then when you have that cross vulnerability, you know, you're living the HIV, then you're also a transgender. It becomes a devil, like, it becomes so huge for you to be in position to access services. I mean, how do you go, first of all, to go and access services when you're living the HIV? Then the other thing is, how do you again start, a, I mean, explaining yourself that, I mean, are you going to be admitted on a male ward or you're going to be admitted on a female ward? For example, you're a transgender, uh, transgender woman, right? This young transgender woman who is living with HIV and maybe has to be hospitalized. In the healthcare setting, are they admitted on the male ward or they're admitted on the female ward? Or there is some other setting that is conducive for them? So those are some of the challenges that um, uh, as young people uh, we do face. And of course, our colleagues who are not able to speak as some of us have always uh, endured in case they need to um, access uh, treatment. Then the other thing is the adolescents, the much younger ones, then report the issues to do with, which may not be stigma and discrimination uh, specifically, but they are associated in a way that um, the pill burden, the number of pills they have to take, you know, and then the non-existence of treatment for opportunistic infections, especially uh, skin infections, what? So you find that this young person from childhood has developed um, uh, what? on the skin, they have the, 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 the skin discolorization, and that alone makes like everyone look at you, like what is causing all this to this one? Then when you go to a facility, a healthcare facility, there is no available treatment for that. If it's available, then you have to go and buy it. And young people, are, are, I mean, they don't have money. I'm not saying they're poor, but they are not yet in the working class. And those who are working cannot afford to take the care of themselves, pay the bills, you know, house rent, uh, school, and so on, and as well as, well as pay attention to, I mean, uh, be in position to pay for medical bills. The other thing is, um, um, young people in the HIV, just like another young person, they're in schools. Now there is fear of taking pills when the, their colleagues are seeing in the dormitories, especially those who reside reside at schools, and, and then those who don't reside in schools have got an issue of accessing safe water to take medicines, if, for example, they have to take them while at school. So those are some of the challenges that young people are, uh, um, are experiencing. So how then do we go to, what have we done as uh, a community or as a movement of young people living the HIV globally to address some of this? So what we are doing is to communicate to communicate and communicate soundly with whoever uh, whoever is a duty bearer, starting with um, healthcare providers within the facilities where we get treatment, but as well as uh, policymakers at district level, at national level, and whoever uh, is concerned, for example, um, UNAIDS, WHO, and so on and so forth. So we are communicating and we are saying that we are more than patients. When we come to facilities, when young people come to facilities, we are more than patients, that people with HIV. I mean, I'm working in the facility to get only my refills. I'm not sick. I just have a condition, just like someone can be hypertensive, you know, and has to come for antihypertensive refills, or some, like someone can be asthmatic, but he's not coming in with attack, but he's coming maybe to get, to coming in to get maybe traditional, traditional refills. So we are not patients. We are more than patients. We have uh, desires beyond our HIV positive status. The other thing is we're communicating and making sure that everyone understands that preventing HIV infections is everyone's role. It's not just those pe the people living with HIV, it's everyone. When you're opening up your skirt or your trouser for, for, for a sexual activity that may, you know, for a sexual activity, you should think as well about HIV. So it's not just a role that should be, you know, should be put on people with HIV alone. So that's what we are communicating. And then the other thing is, most importantly, is to make sure that the available environment, the environment that we are living in, and the people we are interacting with, make it possible for us to come out and access services, starting with HIV testing, and, HIV counseling and testing. 
than to HIV treatment. If the, co the community around us doesn't make us feel comfortable to go out um, and, and test and also get on treatment and be in position to, to be retained in care, then at the end of the day, we shall present, present ourselves in later stages of HIV. For example, when you already have the overt AIDS on you. Then the other thing is that, um, of course, we are, we are communicating that we are not going to be treated as vectors for transmission, but we want to be treated as people. We want to, to, to be treated like any other person in the, in the community. And most importantly, what we have done uh, so far, uh, the tangible ones that, pro pro that probably I can, um, I can share with you, is to advocate for setting standards, minimum service and care package for, for uh, HIV treatment. Uh, we've done this with, uh, we did this last, last year in Uganda with the Ministry of Health with support from UNICEF and Baylor to come up with those minimum services that can be, that should be, not can be, that should be provided to this adolescent or young person who moves into a facility. We know that we have different levels of, 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 of service, of service delivery. We have those facilities at, you know, community level, uh, le uh, village level, parish level then to district level or sub-national and national. So we are like, if this young person comes into a facility at, for example, sub-county level, what are those minimums that this person should be, um, should be provided with? You know, counseling, HIV treatment, septic fields, checking for pneumonia infections, including uh, skin conditions. If this young person is already sexually active or not, then there should be a conversation about the sexual, you know, sexual life of this, uh, of this person. Because like any other person, like any, 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 other, any other person in the community, there are also sexual beings, they have feelings, they want to be in relationships, and actually we are in relationships. So can we have a conversation that is not stigmatizing, that is empowering at the end of the day to empower Musa and the rest to be in position to, to disclose to our loved ones you know, to disclose in a manner that is not going to disenfranchise me from the services, but in a manner that is going to bring me closer, you know, to community support and care, as well as linkage to care. So um, basically, that's what we are sharing. And also, we've, we are advocating for one major component within the HIV response, which is measuring impact that as you are providing services in the healthcare setting, are you able to measure impact of the treatment that you're putting this young person or adolescent on? For example, I saw the Modipe, I may talk over time, but please just let me know if my time is up. So we are, we, we are advocating for measuring impact. If this young person comes um, in, in a clinic. One, one minute, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. So if this young person is coming to a clinic and you're providing treatment, are you able, for example, to evaluate you, the impact of your treatment on this young person? For example, are you able to take CD4 if you don't have viral load you know, services? If you have viral load services, are you able to take viral load to, 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 I mean, to, to really understand if treatment is working for this young person? Because we know that we have, in our communities, we have reports of young people who are failing on treatment for one reason or the other. You know, so are you able to identify failure on treatment on time? So that at the end of the day, the treatment you give is not just, for, I mean, to document in registers how much ARVs or how many people you have attended to, but as well you're communicating what impact the treatment is having on your clients who are coming to the ERT clinic. So basically those are some of the things that we are doing and the, some of the challenges that young people and adolescents are, are, are getting in uh, experiencing in the healthcare setting. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Musa. Wow, thank you. Um, you discussed a lot of well-rounded points and you gave us so much insight into that. Thank you so much for that. So we will be moving to the second part of the webinar. And the question I have next is for both speakers. So I think Alice will go first, then after Alice, you, Musa. So the question goes thus. Youth play an essential leadership role in all social and political changes. Now, what would be your piece of advice to all the young advocates watching this as IFMSA members who strive to make a change? How can they work towards a healthcare system 
that is more inclusive, establish relations with people with HIV and with young key populations. So that Alice so Okay, thank you, Modupe. So first of all, um, in addition to all that I've mentioned above already, you could find out what rights to work in what professions people with HIV have in your country. And if they don't have full rights to work in healthcare, work with a youth organization of young people living with HIV and your medical professional association to challenge and change that. Because now that we have undetectable equals uninfectious, the people with HIV should have the right to work in any area of healthcare. Maybe major invasive surgery might still be a question mark. But basically, if your load is, viral load is undetectable, you ought to be able to work anywhere in a healthcare setting and can bring insights uh, through your own experience to that work, just as Musa is doing. Secondly, find out what the policy and practice is, is in your own Ministry of Health towards people living with and or affected by HIV in your own hospital or health center. Are people living with HIV able to feel safe being open about their own status? And if not, why not? A few years ago, WHO found that only 10% of people living with HIV in healthcare acquire it through occupational health, and that's probably even less nowadays. So the rest acquire it through normal life outside work. Frontline health workers, especially women, who are overstretched, underpaid, struggling with their own issues, such as violence against women in their homes or looking after orphans. They often, unfortunately, treat women with HIV harshly, maybe as a way of protecting themselves from colleagues' suspicions. So a colleague doesn't ask, hmm, she's being nice to that woman. I wonder whether she's got HIV herself. So how can you support women in the front care, front of health care, to support them to feel safe, to share their status with their colleagues or with you who's in charge of the ward. Remember some of your own student colleagues at present may have HIV too, like Musa, or feel unable to share that. And Musa is obviously very courageous that he does share it. Or maybe you have HIV yourself, like Musa, and you're feeling nervous about sharing it with your colleagues, and you're not alone if you are. So how can you make people living with HIV feel safe in your own clinics? So the first thing my family doctor who told me I have HIV was, can I give you a hug? And that was back in 92, remember, before there was any treatment. She was asking my permission. She wasn't saying, oh, I'm going to give you a hug. She was putting me in the driving seat. Can I give you a hug? You can ask this too of your clients in your care. You can say, and you can grow up, you can have children if you want them, you can get married if you want to, you can finish your education, you can have a career, you can fulfill your dreams. However you acquired HIV, it is not your fault. It's just an illness and is fully treatable and manageable. It's just a condition, just like Musa said. Provided you have good care, respect and support, we will do our best to give you all of that here. There are others like you who have HIV, and if you like, we could put you in touch with them so that you can see for yourself that what I'm saying is true. And if you did that, you'd be like those physicians in France who realize that that first contact with that person is critical for their future ability to cope with their, this huge, life-changing news that you've just given them. Next, you can involve people living with HIV in all your research and your advisory groups, in shaping the design of the questions, how they're asked, in training and supporting them to become co-researchers and include them as co-authors too, so they get the credit too for their insights. Then the quality of your research will improve dramatically because you will be asking the right questions, getting answers which make sense to those you want to be and stay in your care as well as to you. You will create effective, successful programs together and you'll find that your levels of adherence will shoot up. Then you can work in multidisciplinary teams which put your clients' visions and needs first and which include lay trained people living with HIV or use drugs or who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans or who do sex work or have grown up with HIV. People in all their diversities who have personal experience of the issues your clients are facing. And then lastly, keep reading and learning about gender rights, diversity rights, child rights, violence against women, 
sex and reproductive health, all of these things. There's so many exciting changes afoot and you can be part of them and shape them. So seize all the opportunities that come your way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. I'm sure Dean has something to take home from this. So, um, Musa, I'll be asking you the same question about what you think the youth, you, the youth advocates that are watching this webinar can do if they want to collaborate with people living with HIV and young key populations and how they can strive to make a change. So, um, you'll be talking for five minutes each. So, Alice has already answered. So, now, thank you. Hi, Musa. We're okay. Oh, sorry. Hello, am I on now? Yes, you yes, you are. Yes, 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 yes. very well. Thank you so much, uh, Madupe. And of course, thank you so much, uh, my colleague, uh, my senior colleague, Alice, for uh, those wonderful thoughts. Um, for the colleagues who might be watching this, for the colleagues who might be watching this, who might be interested in or motivated to join this campaign, what I the first thing I first, uh, the first thing to do I think is to motivate themselves to understand HIV, understand HIV beyond um, the disease condition, you know, and even if it is just a disease condition, motivate themselves around, especially the medical students around those associated aspects of health that HIV might come with. Uh, for medical students, uh, like I said earlier on, we need, you, you, we need to motivate ourselves around sexual and reproductive health needs and aspirations for people with HIV, including young people and adolescents. So that whatever we are doing in the healthcare uh, setting, or for example, in your clinic when you're seated there, I mean, look at this young person or adolescent, or this woman, or bit a man beyond just the HIV diagnosis, but you know, as sexual beings. For example, looking at um, STI, STIs management, if it is a, a, a woman or a young woman looking at reproductive cancers, including cervical cancer, cervical cancer has been reported to be one of the major cancers in HIV uh, in, in, um, that, that is affecting women living with HIV. The other thing is pregnancy, and of course, in line with elimination of mother-to-child transmission. Then around, we need to motivate our, ourselves around mental health. What does it mean for this young person or this adolescent living with HIV around mental health? Issues of drug use and HIV, issues to do with adherence, depression and mania, issues to do with body disfigurement. We've, we, we, we have young people who have started on stabbing-based regimens who are like, whose bodies, are suffering from fat distribution. You know, the limbs are small, but the belly is huge. You know, they're like pregnant when, when they're not yet, when they're not pregnant. So we need to motivate ourselves around beauty, you know, when we're dealing with young people and adolescents, then also the quality of care that we are providing, you know, issues to do with side effects management, issues to do with HIV comorbidities comor like tuberculosis, hepatitis C and B, issues to do with skin, um, rashes, and others. Then, um, now those are specifics as a, young, uh, as, as a future physician who's going to maybe work in this response. But as someone in the movement who wants to, to, to cause change, first of all, you need to realize that no one is immune for HIV infection. No one is immune against HIV. Anyone can be HIV positive anytime, any day, anywhere. Whether you're straight, whether you're transgender, whether you MSM, whether you lesbian, whether you, you use drugs, and so on and so forth. No one is immune. The other thing is, people live with HIV, including young people and adolescents, are people just like anyone, anyone else. So they have aspirations beyond taking treatment and beyond you know, taking treatment, ARVs and septuin. And if they're taking treatment, let's ensure that we are connecting the dots of drug stockouts the quality of the ARVs, including the regimens in terms of how many pills someone has to take a day. You know, as medical students, we can do a, a, a lot around that. Then the other thing is bringing to the picture the issue of non-communicable diseases that right now are, uh, are um, building a house around people in the HIV. The issues to do with diabetes mellitus, 
you know, issues to do with uh, mental health, like I said earlier on. Then, as medical students, we needed to set a minimum standard of care for people with HIV. That at the end of the day, when this person has come on my desk, what are those things that at least I should make sure that I've, I've, I've taken or have examined or have, you know, ruled in and out for this person? And then the other thing is, we need to look around because we have results that reports that HIV related stigma and discrimination not only affects the people in the HIV themselves, but as well as the people who give care, the healthcare workers, doctors who give care to people in the HIV, as well as those doctors might be living with HIV, like Musa, who's like, like, like Musa and, and the rest. So, as medical students who want to join this movement, yeah. Are you able to connect the different dots and be in the picture, you know, and think holistically? Thank you so much. Um, sometimes I, I speak so much. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. That was very, very great. Um, I'm sure that everyone watching is inspired and has a lot to learn and has learned so much already from this. So now that we finished the main questions, we'll be going to the questions from people that are watching. So we'll have the questions and answer session now. So I will hand over to Carlis, who will take that up from there. Thank you so much, Lupe. Um, and obviously, like, thank you uh, to both Alice and, and Musa. I think that uh, your, like, your answers were perfect and, and, and actually something that we can really learn from. And I'm actually like hoping that after this webinar, we can uh, expand a bit, like, uh, like, our collaboration with the two of you and see if we can uh, we can find um, the common grounds uh, to work or like other like kind of like opportunities to build some capacity with your help uh, among our members um, before like I mentioned that before closing uh, remarks we will take some questions from from the audience we have some from both the chat box and some others that that came, came through different like channels from people that cannot access the chat box so I will start with a question from uh, coming directly from Germany uh, um, Frederica from Germany asked uh, uh, Alice uh, the following question um, Concerning social and medical support for people living with HIV, can you talk about how women living with HIV are or are not specifically recognized and addressed by these offers? And also, like complementing that question, how would you say discrimination in healthcare has changed between the 90s and now? Are there continuing patterns that have persisted? Where did we make steps forward, uh, and which steps uh, backward, uh, backwards did we unfortunately take? Hi, thank you, Frederica. Those are great questions. Uh, so, first of all, um, concerning social and medical support. Um, well, I guess what I was saying was there are some centers of excellence which are really great, um, but for the most part, unfortunately, both social and medical support um, let that women down a lot. And I think one of the challenges that we face, and this relates to your second question as well about discrimination in healthcare, is that um, Musa was talking about comorbidities, and I think what people really haven't appreciated is how greatly balance against women is essentially a comorbidity in relation to HIV. Because um, in some parts of the world where there's high, high prevalence of HIV, basically balance against women can increase a woman's likelihood of acquiring HIV or SDIs by a factor of 1.5, and this is from WHO research. But it's only recently really being understood um, partly through the research that we've been doing for WHO, how widespread that experience of violence against women after diagnosis is. And uh, just by way of example, the ART guidelines from WHO from June 2016, it's a 480-page document, and it only mentions violence or a word like violence maybe four or five times in the whole document. Whereas if you look at the consolidated SRHR guideline, which uh, was based on our participatory research with women around the world living with HIV, it's a document which is only um, a quarter of the length, 120 pages, and it mentions the word violence over 200 times. 
So I think that basically tells you the answer in a nutshell. There are some centers of excellence occasionally, which really recognize how critical the whole violence thing is and how women are often actually voting with their feet when they don't come back for health care uh, because they're terrified about being found with a, with medication and scared about what will happen to them at home and also the, the negative, the very bad way in which they're being treated in healthcare settings is adding to their mental health stress. So there are, of course, fantastic um, advances. Um, you know, if you have an undetectable viral load, you can now have um, a baby through normal vaginal delivery with less than 1% chance of the baby acquiring HIV. WHO also in these guidelines now recommends uh, breastfeeding for women in low and middle income countries um, if they want to, for women living with HIV, just as any woman would have if they have an undetectable viral load with regular supervision or um, monitoring. So those are incredible advances, but we have to go on recognizing that we have to address the violence which women are experiencing at home, in the community, and in healthcare settings if we're really going to make those advances that we need to in that holistic way. Thank you so much, um, Alice, for your answer. Um, I'm sure that uh, Federica was like, very satisfied with this answer. Um, um, we're going to move on to, to another question from the audience. Um, and like before ask, uh, before like uh, saying the question, um, like I just wanted to mention that like Elizabeth uh, from Nigeria, uh, she thinks that the webinar has been amazing so far, and thanks you both for your um, like. Uh, like uh, insights and for your contributions and she has a question specifically for Musa um, so Elizabeth asked um, hey Musa uh, I'd like to ask you if you feel the medical curriculum uh, currently adequately covers uh, HIV related education um, and what do you think about it uh, as a person uh, being both a medical student and, and, and living with HIV Hi, um, thank you so much, um, Elizabeth from Nigeria for that wonderful question. Um, as a person, given the realities that I have faced and experiences of my colleagues, I don't think the current uh, medical curriculum, at least in my country, is uh, fits to address, uh, to address HIV as um, HIV as as a condition, I was trying to get which word to use because in medicine, HIV is looked at as a disease condition, right? But again, when you look broadly, HIV is beyond just a medical condition, has got aspects that go beyond medicine. And as such, so if we are producing doctors who are going to be in position to provide services that meet the the present and the emerging needs of people in the HIV, then we need to think broadly and then examine the current curriculum if, 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 if it fits what we want to do. For example, starting with uh, the, our oath, Hippocrates oath, uh, the healthcare setting, whoever comes in is a patient, right? So in the healthcare setting, people in the HIV are addressed as patients. Even when Musa is walking in, like I walk in to go and maybe just get my refills for um, my AHRBs, I'm referred as a patient. And of course, I'll be required to sit in the line as a patient. You know, patients are seated, you no know, waiting. Yet I'm not a patient. I'm just someone who needs ARVs. I'm not, I'm not presenting with any, you know, with any complaint. You get it? So that alone needs to be changed. I don't know whether it should be, I don't know, but it needs to be addressed. Then the other thing is, for example, if it is in medicine or pediatrics, whether it is gain and OBS, it will be, it will be, I mean, you'll, you'll be taught about HIV, its etiology, its, uh, uh, its uh, uh, pathophysiology, and its treatment, 
prognosis and so on, diagnosis for the lab. But I mean, just like I, like I said, more needs to be understood around HIV. More needs to, to be, for example, in terms of pills, we were prescribing these pills. Are we taking into account the pill button? Are we taking into account treatment supporters in terms of the, the people who are going to, uh, to help this person take the treatment? Are we taught that in medicine at medical school? No. Are we talking, are we looking at the safe water that this person needs at home to take medicines? Of course, you'll be told, oh, please take medicine with water. But who looks at, med at medical school? Do we look into the source of the water and the availability of the water? Do we look into nutrition? Of course, we are, we have, we, we, we are I mean, encouraged as people in the HIV to, to, to eat well. But who at medical school are we taught? Are we, do, do we look into the source of the food and the quality of the food and how often do, do, we, uh, do people have access to food if they are able to have a meal in the morning, a lunch, and also in the evening? Are we taught those things? No. Are we taught about accommodation, where we live, where the people live? Is it a congested area? Is it crowded? Does it have enough lighting, you know, to do, I mean, I mean to, to, to prevent against um, other illnesses that might arise from overcrowding, like tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, you know? Are we able to look at where this person gets the money to come into the facility? Is he or she working? Is he or she at school? You know, how do they take their meds? So there are a lot of things, and also the, the environment. Are we told whether the environment that these people live in is conducive for them to come out, first of all, to go for a test, and also to accept the results? You get it? So there are a number of things that the medical field or the medical curriculum in its current state doesn't respond to. So we need to challenge ourselves as medical students, but of course, the, the medical field cannot be, can, cannot be you know, a one-size-fits-all. We, can, we cannot address everything. So then the medical field needs to, to see how it connects to the, social, the sociology component, you know, the nutritional component of it, but also the legal the, and policy environment and also the political environment. But that is not taught. We are taught just to identify and treat, curative. And if something, then some preventive. You get, but how do, how do people, you know, live in society? Those things are not taught to us. So basically, that's from my perspective, and of course, uh, guided by the realities that, the realities that my, my, challenge, my, my, my peers have, you know, have, uh, have, um, are, are living, and the challenges that they report every day through our networks and organizations. Perhaps we can, we, we can maybe turn to you, Elizabeth, and maybe share with, share with you, also share with us what is happening in Nigeria and what perhaps can be done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Musa, uh, for, uh, for another like, uh, insightful answer. Um, regarding like, medical curriculum, I, I wanted to briefly add that IFMSA is actually currently working on developing a medical education guidance to, um, to kind of like use as a tool to advocate for more inclusive um, uh, medical curriculums uh, that uh, consider also like the needs of people living with HIV in key populations. So maybe that would um, be something that, uh, that we could look into together. Um, we both like uh, you, Alice and, and, and Musa, to see if you if you have any input from my, from your side. But it's definitely something that needs to be worked upon uh, quite a lot because uh, I do not know any like medical student from my FMSA that feels like their medical curriculum encompasses like the uh, like needs and and the, the the challenges that all like people like um, like regardless of uh, who they are like where they come from um, uh, have. Um, okay, so we have. Sorry, Charles. Oh. I, I just I just forgot something. To that, that I want to add. Um, uh, you know, when we are clerking patients, that that's what we use them. I'm using the word patients because we are in the healthcare setting. Otherwise, it's not a good word to use. Uh, if we are, when we are clerking patients, we start with uh, the name, right? For example, this is Musa Lumumba. Uh, whether it is 16 or 20 or 30 years, uh, then male or female, right? But we know that we have people who don't identify as male. And female, for example, I was sharing the experiences of transgender women. 
So this transgender woman on, 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 on the clerkship, what will you indicate? Does the medical curriculum or the medical setting in, um, in Nigeria or Uganda or wherever we are allow us to, to use trans woman on the sheet? Can you write that? And if this person needs admission, you know, will you admit on the male ward or female ward or which ward? Okay. No, those are some of the things that we, we need to also look at. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Obviously, like applying a gender perspective uh, throughout, like uh, like uh, healthcare is uh, extremely necessary uh, to cover the needs of everyone. Um, thank you for that contribution. And I think we also have a tool on this that will be developed last year um, on the building an LGBTQ plus like inclusive uh, curriculum. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to two last questions, and this one will go um, for. Um, like uh, Alice, and then we will have a second one for Musa. This one comes from Divine. Uh, she she's one of our members from Rwanda, and and she wants to ask. Um, so many young people fear to come like to disclose their HIV status. Um, could you um, maybe like let us like know like or tell like young people um, like. How can like what what are the circumstances like that, that they need to take into account to like uh, to to disclose a, a, in a safe way or 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 actually like uh, reveal like their status um, to like to the people that are closer to them um, they can how they can they kind of like let go of the fear and and not be that scared to come out in that sense. That's a question from Divine. Thank you, Alice, beforehand. Okay. Um, so first of all, um, I think one of the most important things is that we mustn't blame individuals if they feel nervous about sharing their status. And I think that part of the problem is because there's so much stigma and discrimination that um, part of the reason for the stigma and discrimination is that because often we're blaming people and saying, oh, they should disclose, they should tell this, they should do that. And there's a lot of should, 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 which is actually very, very isolating and discriminating in itself. And, um, you know, even the word disclose, I know that you didn't use it, Divine, but even the word disclose is actually, it makes it somehow sound legalistic, as if there's a criminal thing that they've done, which they need to disclose to the authorities. So we don't even like using the word disclose. We talk about sharing or discussing. And also, We've actually done quite a lot of, the, I was mentioning earlier, the Stepping Stones program and the Stepping Stones with Children program in particular is designed for, for young people, for children, in fact, five to eight, nine to 14 and their caregivers. Um, and it, uh, there's a lot in there around supporting people to, to, to share what's going on in their lives, supporting the caregivers to, to share with the children. But what's absolutely critical about it is we say, look, this is everybody's responsibility and we're not going to impose this on anybody we're going to support caregivers to to feel when they feel ready to to share and that we will all be there to support them or you know in the case of young people also if they themselves are struggling with this to say we're all here to support you you're not alone this is a huge journey which we're all on and i think there is so much that can be done through peer support and do you remember when I was suggesting there were things that you as, as doctors could do to support people in your care? And one of them was I was suggesting when you feel ready to, if you would like, you could meet other young people like you or people of your age group and learn from them about how, you know, this isn't a death sentence, how you can do so many things in life. And that peer support, it's really, really shown how it makes such a huge difference to individuals in terms of their ability to cope, their mental health issues, their effective responses to, to, to feeling that, that you know, they are people in their own right, they have the right to all of the things they want to do in life, and um, supporting them to share their information if they want to, when they feel ready to. So it, it goes back to everything that we're saying, that wider enabling environment, that we're all here to support you and enabling and supporting those, those peer support programs, which so often get forgotten about and don't get funded, but they're critical.
Thank you so much, Alice, once again. Um, um, I'm also sure that Lake Divine uh, found like, this answer very satisfactory. Um, we, <laughs> we're going to move on to the last, um, the last question. Um, and this one comes uh, once again from uh, Frederica from Germany. Um, she has a question uh, for M Musa, but I think that it can also apply to Alice. Alice, so we will uh, maybe we can get an answer first from Musa, and then and and then see Alice. Maybe if you would like to complement it. So um, the question initially for Musa is: uh, Musa, you mentioned how it is important to acknowledge how everybody living with HIV or not wants to enjoy pleasurable sex while people living with HIV are often only regarded and stigmatized as vectors when it comes to their sexual life. How can we as healthcare providers contribute to the recognition and protection of the right and importance to have a self-determined, pleasurable sexual life outside of healthcare settings? Um, if you can uh, take like two minutes, two minutes to answer this question and then we can have like um, maybe some comments from Alice if, if she has any. Thank you beforehand, Musa. Musa, the floor is yours. Oh, sorry, I was I was speaking while my my microphone was on mute. Um, I was saying, I think from the medical point of view, what we need to to really um, help with is to document and share facts. We need to share facts with the public, with the communities, and with everyone else that once someone living with HIV is identified, is put on treatment and and helped to adhere on treatment, then we can achieve viral load suppression. Of course, we need to emphasize that just putting on people on treatment alone is not will not lead us to viral load suppression. But you know, making sure that the system and the environment and social enablers are in space in 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 place, all are in play to ensure that there is viral load suppression. Then we let the uh, the public know that with viral load suppression, someone, someone's chances of, you know, passing over the virus to the sex partner is, the chance is very, very minimal. So we need to document that as medical students. Then communicate in a language that everyone else, including policymakers and the community members will understand. So when we are able to show that, then the public will understand that Someone just having a, having a positive diagnosis is not enough for someone to transmit HIV, you know? Someone can only uh, uh, transmit HIV if they are, they are not on treatment that works for them or they are not yet identified. So we need to, be, to, to ensure that the environment out there is conducive for people to be identified, not to be identified like you, you're living with HIV or you, you're positive, but I mean to come up and test for HIV and then if they, are, if, if, if they are found positive, then enrolled on treatment that works for them, on treatment that is not stigmatizing, on treatment that enables them, I mean, carry on their daily duties. And also um, uh, on treatment that allows them to live a healthy life that doesn't raise eyebrows to the would-be partner. For example, if this is a young person with HIV, and is put on treatment and doesn't uh, doesn't develop skin conditions, especially the ones that are always chronic. Then, I mean, it should, it should be hard for someone to point fingers. So, when it comes to sex, of course, someone wants to enjoy sex, pleasurable sex with the person of their choice. So, basically, it is just emphasizing we as using using the medical knowledge to document scientifically that having HIV diagnosis alone doesn't that amount to HIV transmission, but not, not, uh, not addressing the needs of people in the HIV, then that amounts to HIV transmission. So basically that's what I, that is what I can share around that.
I'm not gonna answer the question. Yes, thank you so much. So, um, like, like lately for the past like months in IFMSA, we've been trying also to move from a more like when we talk about like prevention, when we do like HIV related interventions, we try to move on from a like like risk based approach to a more like sex positive approach. And I think that kind of like lines up a bit with uh, what you were mentioning and what what uh, Federica's question was. Um, um, and I wanted to see if Alice had any remarks regarding this matter. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. So in addition to what Musa says, I mean, I, and I completely um, agree with your idea about, you know, promoting sexual pleasure instead of the prevention mantra, because again, it goes back to language. Prevention is very negative, very uh, um, oppressive, very judgmental. Um, and very kind of fault and blame laden. Whereas, you know, promoting sex, for people to be happy, healthy, and safe, happy, healthy, hot, and safe, you know, that everybody has a right to that. You know, we're all sexual beings. And so, you know, that is, is, is so important. And um, there are some fantastic workshops. For instance, there's an organization called Positively UK in the UK, which has recently had a really great evening uh, for women living with HIV around sexual pleasure and, and looking at sex toys together, which apparently was brilliant. And I attended a, another workshop on all of the different things around sexual pleasure for women living with HIV. So, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot out there which, which is, is definitely worth building on. And again, this goes back to peer mentoring, you know, small groups of people coming together and, I, and discussing these things in a positive way. I just wanted to add in the context of, of young women, of course, there's also the issues around uh, pregnancy and also for everybody, of course, issues around STIs. And so, you know, I appreciate that a lot of people don't want to use condoms, but at the same time, I think everybody should have the right to use a condom if they want to. And that involves communication and relationship skills, because often people don't feel comfortable using hormonal contraception. And even if they do, that still doesn't get around the SDIs issue. Um, and there are so many multi-drug resistant strains of SDIs out there these days that, you know, condom is issues are a real big, big issue. And so, again, this comes back to the stepping stones training that we've done where we've really supported young people and older people to, to develop communication and relationship skills so that they can safely negotiate condom use. And that's an ongoing issue. It's not something about, okay, once I've negotiated it, great. It's the next night and the next night. So, you know, again, these are lifelong journeys for people. And again, peer mentor support and ways of, of, of actually being able to communicate effectively and support each other to say, I feel and I understand, to enable one another to step into other's shoes, really to understand from their perspective, is a fantastic way of reducing or stopping violence against women, as well as enabling people to enjoy themselves sexually with pleasure, feeling hot and happy and safe. Thank you so much once again, Alice, um, uh, for your um, contribution. Um, this would be the end of, uh, of our question round. Um, we, we can collect extra questions in the chat box and then send them over uh, to our speakers. So if you're watching this and you still have some questions, uh, feel free to leave them either in the chat box or as comments in the YouTube uh, video, and we will forward them um, to uh, to our colleagues. Um, so, like now, uh, to wrap up the the, the webinar, um, uh, I will ask both Musa and, and Alice to share three, with three sentences, uh, like um, their take home message from this conversation that we had uh, for the past hour. Um, maybe you would like to start, Musa. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Charles and F the FMC fraternity um, for joining this campaign to address stigma and discrimination in the healthcare setting to ensure that um, everyone else living with HIV is able to meet services that, that address their needs in terms of accessing them and utilizing them. Uh, my, my, my last, my, my um, ending remarks um, out of this discussion, I think we need to set standards for stigma and discrimination in the healthcare setting with mechanisms that are able to monitor and evaluate the, our interventions 
so that the results we get are not just for statistics, nor to shame people, but for targeted actions. For people with HIV, for the healthcare providers who as well provide services to uh, people with HIV. But for FMCA as an organization or as a network, you might need to develop, implement and evaluate capacity building strategies that orient medical students to offer in future non-stigmatizing HIV services that meet the evolving and emerging needs of people with HIV beyond their HIV status. And then the other thing is perhaps to work closely with people with HIV at the centers that you that you be treated, or perhaps in this case can be FMC and Y plus um, and, and other um, key population uh, key population networks for young people, especially at national level, and also at, com at community levels um, where you can provide accurate information which can be, you know, communicated in a language that communities do understand, of course, with the tools and resources to facilitate a robust community-led response to stigma and discrimination and in the healthcare settings. Uh, basically, that's what I have to share with you. Perhaps I can also motivate you around, um, you, can, you may start up a, a campaign which can be like uh, me and my healthcare, you know, provider, you know, where you have like people, young people in the HIV as well as FMC, the future healthcare providers, you know, campaign to address stigma and discrimination. Over to you, Alice, and thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Musa. So, okay, so um, from me, I would just like to suggest a few things. First of all, there's a fantastic uh, book written by um, a leading surgeon in the US called Atul Gawande. I hope you've all heard of him already. The book is called Being Immortal. So many people assume that somehow we're going to treat ourselves out of this AIDS pandemic just with throwing medication at it. As you have, I hope, heard from Musa and from myself, you know, HIV is so much more than needing a biomedical techno fix. See the person beyond the diagnosis. And Atul Gawande speaks so wisely and profoundly in this book about the American healthcare system. But there are messages in there for all of us around the importance of humanity, hugs and heart beyond the, the, the biomedical uh, super science intervention. So I really strongly recommend that book to all of you. And then there are good practices out there. And if you'd like to read one, there was certainly one a few years back from the Infectious Diseases Institute at Malago Hospital in Uganda called the Creativity Initiative. So do look into PubMed for that and you'll read a really inspiring article about what was done there and it really made a difference to those people and I hope the program's still going. And then third, I'm just so delighted, Carlos, um, to hear that um, the association is developing these training guidelines or a training manual for medical students because I, this has been so close to my heart, I would absolutely love to be involved in a training program for healthcare providers, particularly when they're still at student level. And so if there was a way forward for us all to find funding to create that, that would just be magic. Thank you all so much for, take, for um, inviting me to take part and it's a real privilege to, to be part of it. Thank you so much, uh, Alice and, and Musa, for your uh, final remarks. I, I think that I, I speak on behalf of like um, the audience, and also like I must say that it was a, a privilege for us also to to have you here. And we look forward to to see what comes next. And I also wanted to thank you, Madupe, for your moderation throughout the the main questions. Um, thank you for taking uh, the lead on that. Um, and Yes, that this is the end of, of the webinar. As a reminder, if you have any questions, you can always leave them in the um, YouTube comments and we will um, make send them over to the speakers. Um, thank you so much for joining and um, looking forward to the next uh, uh, to the next opportunity to collaborate uh, together.